guy is huge, isn't he, Squeaks? <laughs> oh, hi there. Squeaks and I were just reading a book about giants. This book is fiction, but did you know that giants exist in nature too? <laughs> really, there are giant plants and animals that make other living things look tiny. Do you remember when we learned about the biggest flower in the world? <laughs> You're right. It wouldn't fit in a flower vase, but it's pretty amazing just the same. Let's take a trip back to Indonesia to see how big these giant flowers can get. Yeah, you're right. Oh, hi there. Squeaks and I are deciding what flowers to plant in our garden next. We're thinking of planting some daisies, maybe some sunflowers, lots of big, beautiful blooms. Squeaks wants really big flowers, the biggest in the whole world. But I'm afraid the biggest flower in the world would be really unusual to have in our garden, Squeaks, because unlike other flowering plants, it lives inside another plant. This is the biggest flower in the world, Rafflesia arnoldii. It lives in Indonesia, and its flowers are almost a meter across. That means you'd struggle to fit one through your front door. They're also very heavy for flowers. They can weigh up to about seven kilograms, roughly the weight of a bowling ball. That's a big flower. Well, hold on, Squeaks. Before you make any decisions, you should know they're also very smelly. Some people even call them corpse flowers because they smell like rotting meat. That's a great question, Squeaks. Why does this flower stink so much when most flowers smell nice? Well, let's think about it for a moment. How might smelling good help the flower? Right, smelling good attracts pollinators. Pollinators are animals like bees that help flowering plants make seeds by moving their pollen from one flower to another. Many pollinators are attracted to sweet smells because they eat sweet things, like the nectar flowers make. Well, this flower is also trying to draw in pollinators, but it's not after bees. Its powerful, stinky smell attracts flies. Flies like to eat dead animals, so they go into the flower thinking that stinky smell is some yummy old meat. And while they're inside investigating the stench, they get the flower's pollen on them. They carry this pollen with them when they leave. And that means when they check out another flower, they leave some of it behind. So the smell is the plant's way of getting the flies to move their pollen around. Oh, what do the leaves look like? Well, that's the weird thing. This flower actually doesn't have any leaves or roots or even a stem that we can see. That's a really good question. All plants need water and light to grow. Most flowers use their roots to suck up water from the soil and their leaves to collect light from the sun so they can make food for themselves. But this flower doesn't have any of those parts. So how does it live and eat? Well, it's what scientists call a parasite, a living thing that steals from other living things to survive. Like you might be familiar with fleas, they're parasites that feed on the blood of animals, including people. Their bites often leave itchy red bumps on your skin, which are really annoying. In the case of Rafflesia, it steals the water and food it needs from another plant. And it does this by growing inside it. Rafflesia seeds are really tiny, so they can get into small scratches on the roots or stems of the vines they live inside. And once there, it steals what it needs to grow. It takes food the vine made from sunlight using its leaves and water the vine sucked up from the soil using its roots. So the Rafflesia doesn't need leaves or roots of its own. And that means it can put all its efforts into making massive flowers. When the flower buds are ready, they burst out of the vine to bloom. The flowers do hurt the vine, kind of like how flea bites don't feel awesome, but they don't kill it. Parasites need the living things they steal from, so they usually don't kill them. So what do you think, Squeaks? Do you still want to grow the biggest flowers in the world here?
Oh, that's true. The vine and the Rafflesia arnoldii both grow really far away in a very different habitat than what we have here at the fort. Maybe we can grow something else that would remind us of this awesome and smelly plant. <laughs> That's a great idea. We can research and find out if there are any plants that are parasites living near the fort, and maybe try growing some of those. Plants have so many amazing ways to get what they need. Some grow on the ground, while some grow out of other plants. And some smell sweet, while others put up a big stink. Wow, that flower was enormous. Some plants get so much bigger than others. <laughs> That's right, Squeaks. I forgot about the world's tallest tree. There's a redwood tree in California called the Hyperion that's even larger than the giant redwoods around it. Should we hike back to the forest to learn more? Meet Hyperion. This impressive looking plant currently holds the title of world's tallest tree. Its name Hyperion means the high one, and that's no joke. Hyperion's top branches tower over all of the trees around it. Its very tippy top is 115 meters above the ground. That's taller than an American football field is long, about twice as tall as the Statue of Liberty in New York City, and about 15 meters taller than the clock tower in London that houses Big Ben. And it's taken a long time for Hyperion to get so big. Scientists think that it's between 700 and 800 years old. Hyperion belongs to a group of trees called redwoods. Redwoods are pretty picky about where they live. They only grow in a few places around the world. Hyperion's home is somewhere in Northern California, in the Redwood National and State Parks. And I say somewhere because except for a few people, no one knows exactly where Hyperion is. Hyperion was discovered by two people hiking through the park. After some scientists measured the tree and crowned it as the world's tallest, everyone who knew where Hyperion was decided to keep its location a secret. They knew that a lot of people would want to see the world's tallest tree. I mean, who wouldn't? But they also knew that too many people walking around the tree might damage its roots or trunk. So they decided that the only way to make sure the tree stayed safe was to let it stay hidden. Fortunately, there are lots of other redwoods to see all around it, as well as lots of other really big trees that are related to the redwood. Another kind of humongous tree is the giant sequoia. Both the giant sequoia and the redwood live for a long time, grow to be very tall, and in some cases, get to be very wide. So there must be something special about these trees. Why are they able to grow so large and so tall? And the answer is, Kind of another secret, because no one knows for sure. Scientists have some pretty good guesses, though. The first is that these trees are really good at staying healthy. All kinds of trees can get diseases that make them sick, just like you and I can catch a cold or the flu or something else. Redwoods make a chemical that helps protect them from diseases. This chemical also tastes really bad to animals like insects, so bugs that might normally like to snack on wood or leaves are likely to stay away from redwood trees. The outer covering of the tree, called the bark, is also very thick in redwoods, in some cases up to 30 centimeters thick. That's about the length of a ruler that you might have in school or at home. And the bark is really stringy and tough. So tough, in fact, that it doesn't burn very easily. So forest fires that damage other kinds of trees probably won't hurt these kinds of trees as much. Another reason that scientists think that redwoods grow so tall is because of where they live. Redwoods need need water, lots of water, so they grow where it's cool and very wet. When it's not raining or snowing where redwoods live, it's usually misty or foggy. If you've ever been outside on a foggy day, you know that the air can feel kind of wet. That's because fog is made of lots of tiny drops of water. Now, redwoods have special leaves called needles, and redwood needles can do something really cool. They can actually take water right out of the fog, so the tree doesn't have to get all of its water from its roots. This way, the tree has two ways to get water, through its needles 
and its roots, instead of just one. And there's more to growing tall than just getting lots of water. Trees also need food, and they get some of the food they need to grow from the soil. Just like healthy foods like fruits and vegetables give us what we need to grow, the soil in Northern California is kind of like those healthy foods, full of the things that trees need to grow. But here's something strange about the world's tallest tree. Even though Hyperion has lots of water, thick bark, and can get good things from the soil, it isn't growing any taller. Scientists think that the tree stopped growing because some woodpeckers damaged the top of it. So who knows, maybe someday there will be another tree that takes over the title as world's tallest, and maybe you'll be the one to find it. I'd say that tree definitely qualifies as a giant. It looks like something that would have lived long ago when a lot of things were bigger. Exactly! Like those Ice Age animals we learned about. Some of the creatures that lived thousands of years ago looked like their relatives today, only larger. Should we put on our coats and take a trip back in time to see the Ice Age giants? <laughs> Squeaks and I love it when the weather gets warm. We get to have picnics, go to the beach, and spend all day exploring. But you know, the Earth didn't always get this warm every year. It goes through some warmer periods and some colder ones. A very long time ago, the world went through what's called an ice age. It was so cold that a lot of the Earth's water stayed frozen as ice for most of the year. Most of that ice went away about 12,000 years ago, way before your parents or grandparents were born. But before that, when so much of the world was covered in ice, life looked a little different. A lot of the same kinds of animals we have on our planet today were around then too. Yes, including rat squeaks. But there were also some animals back then that have since died out. Animals that were much bigger than we're used to. If you were to take an Ice Age tour around the world, you'd meet some pretty wacky characters. Imagine meeting a Glyptodon, a relative of the armadillo. That's right, we've learned about armadillos before. They're covered in armor to keep them safe from other animals. The Glyptodon looked a lot like an armadillo, and it also had armor, but it was the size of a car. Some Glyptodons even had sharp spikes on their tails. There were also giant beavers, which could grow to two and a half meters long and weigh 100 kilograms. Imagine a cute little beaver, but grown to the size of a bear. And there were mastodons and mammoths, both relatives of today's elephants. They're all part of the group of animals that have a trunk for a nose. Mastodons and mammoths had a lot in common. They were both enormous, had long shaggy hair that kept them warm, and had trunks to help them scrape snow and ice off the plants they wanted to eat. But there were also some differences between them. For example, mastodons had long pointed tusks, whereas mammoths had curvy ones. And mastodons had cone-shaped teeth to crush the plants they ate but mammoth teeth looked more like crinkly potato chips with ridges to help them grind up grass. But you don't have to worry about running into any of these animals on your way to school. By about 10,000 years ago, they had all gone extinct, meaning they weren't around anymore. And even if you did run into a mastodon or glyptodon, you wouldn't have to worry. Everyone we just met was an herbivore, which means they ate plants, not other animals. But some giant animals from the Ice Age did eat other animals. Smilodon was a big cat that lived in North and South America. People sometimes call it a saber-toothed tiger, even though it isn't really a close relative of tigers. But I bet you can guess where the name saber-tooth comes from. Smilodon has two giant teeth that were long and curved, almost like a type of sword called a saber. And Smilodons were predators, which means they hunted and ate other animals. They probably used their giant saber teeth to hunt the other huge animals that lived around the same time, like mastodons and mammoths. Then after hunting down their lunch, they had to eat it. To bite around those giant saber teeth, they were able to open their mouths really wide. Smilodons also had a tongue bone, a lot like today's lion, which probably meant they could roar like one. Just like the animals it ate, the Smilodon is extinct. All these huge Ice Age animals stopped existing by around 10,000
2,000 years ago, and scientists are still trying to figure out why. Some scientists think that humans could have hunted them to extinction, especially mammoths and mastodons. That could be part of why, but there are probably other reasons too. Some other scientists think that when the Earth warmed up again and there was less cold ice and more wet forest, it was harder for these gigantic animals to find enough of the food they usually ate. It could also have been a combination of both. Ice Age animals might have already been having trouble by the time humans started hunting them more. Even if a mastodon was able to find a new place to go after all its favorite plants were gone, once it had to worry about human hunters too, it might not have been able to survive. So these giant animals are gone now, but we can learn all about them by studying the bones they left behind and imagining what it was like to live in a world with car-sized armadillos, huge hairy mastodons, and giant toothed smilodons. I wouldn't want to run into one of those mastodons. They looked kind of scary. <laughs> Squeaks thinks all giant things are scary. But remember how much you liked learning about those huge insects? <laughs> Let's see if we can help Squeaks conquer his fear by having a look at some really big bugs. What kind of animal has six legs, three body parts, and is found pretty much everywhere on Earth? You're right, Squeaks, insects. One of the coolest things about insects is that there are so many different kinds. Think about some of the insects you already know, like butterflies, bees, and ants. They look really different from each other. They're all different shapes, colors, and sizes. Squeaks and I like to go outside and learn more about the insects we find by watching how they move around and what they eat. Sometimes we find some pretty big ones, but they're not even close to the biggest insects in the world, like this one. This is a titan beetle. The name titan actually means big or gigantic, which makes sense because they're huge. These beetles can get to be over 16 centimeters long, longer, than a dollar bill. Just like other beetles you might know, like ladybugs and fireflies, titan beetles have four wings. A beetle's front wings are hard and act as a kind of protective case for the back wings. But it's the other ways that titan beetles protect themselves that make them look so fierce. They have sharp spines on their body and their jaws are super strong. A titan beetle can bite down hard enough with its jaws to snap a pencil in half. There's no reason to be scared of them though, Squeaks. Even though they're super strong, scientists who study titan beetles have found out that they aren't aggressive. That means they don't attack people or any other animal, unless they're scared. But there's a lot we still don't know about them. Scientists aren't sure what adult titan beetles eat, if they eat anything at all. Titan beetles live in the warm, wet rainforest, and scientists think baby titan beetles live underground and eat old and rotting wood. So not only is the titan beetle big, it's also a pretty big mystery. Another huge insect is the giant weta. The name that scientists use for the giant weta means monster-like grasshopper, and it definitely lives up to its name. Giant wettas live in only one place in the world, in the island country of New Zealand. It has some relatives that might be around where you live, though. It's related to the little crickets you can hear chirping outside in the evenings. The giant weta grows to be about 10 centimeters long, which is very long, but still shorter than the titan beetle. But the giant weta is a champion if we measure it in another way. That's because the giant weta is one of the heaviest insects in the world. Some giant wettas can weigh about 70 grams, as much as about 25 pennies. Giant wettas are heavier than most mice and even some small birds. They're too heavy to fly and most giant wettas don't even jump. So we've met a long insect and a heavy insect. Next, let's meet a wide insect the atlas moth. It's pretty easy to see why this insect is so big. Yes, Squeaks, it's wings. Atlas moths have some of the biggest wings of any insect on Earth. They can get to be over 30 centimeters wide. That's about the size of a ruler. Like other moths and butterflies, atlas moths start out as a caterpillar. And these caterpillars are very hungry. They eat a lot of leaves and they grow to be very fat. Then they spin a silk cocoon around themselves and change into a moth while they're inside it. Once these moths come out of their cocoons though, they don't eat at all. 
They only live for about five to seven days, and that whole time they get all their energy from the leaves they ate as caterpillars. The name that people from China use for this moth means snake's head. And if you look at the tops of an atlas moth's wings, you can see a pattern that looks a lot like a snake's head. Scientists think that the pattern might scare away birds or other animals that might want to eat the moth, since the pattern looks like a snake that could eat them. Between the titan beetle, the giant weta, and the atlas moth, there are some pretty big insects out there. Did those cool insects make you feel any better about giant squeaks? <laughs> oh good, then maybe you're ready to talk about the ultimate giant. The biggest animal that ever lived. <laughs> well, it's not a dinosaur or some creature that lived long ago. It's actually alive today, swimming around in the ocean. <laughs> That's right, Squeaks, the blue whale. Hey there, Squeaks was just showing off his imaginary sea monster that he drew based on some sea monsters of the past. I think it's great. I see that it has sharp teeth, big flippers, and an armored head, like the animals we learned about before. And I see you drew yourself swimming next to your monster. Your sea monster is huge! But even your imaginary sea monster doesn't look as big as the biggest, biggest animal that's ever actually lived. Do you know what animal that is, Squeaks? <laughs> it's a kind of whale called the blue whale, and they're still around today. Blue whales can get to be over 30 meters long, about as long as three school buses in a row. And a blue whale's tongue can weigh as much as an elephant. And just its heart can be as heavy as a car. So what do you think these great big blue whales eat? Fish, that's a great guess. And some whales like beluga whales you eat fish. They have sharp teeth that they use to catch and eat their prey. But some whales, like blue whales, don't have teeth at all. <laughs> Weird, right? These whales have something called baleen instead of teeth. Baleen is a bristly plate that's stuck to the roof of the whale's mouth. It looks like a big bristly broom inside their mouths. Ooh, that's a great question. How does it help them eat? Well, if you've ever seen someone cook pasta, they might have dumped it out of the pot and into a strainer when the pasta was done cooking. Water pours out of the strainer, but the food stays inside. Baleen works kind of the same way. When a whale that has baleen takes a gulp of water and food, they use their tongues to push all the water out through the gaps, but keep the tasty food inside. But if they aren't eating fish, what are they eating? Blue whales eat tiny animals called krill. Krill are so small that we need a microscope to see them clearly. That's right, Squeaks. Something as big as a blue whale does need to eat a lot of krill. And they do. Adult blue whales can eat 16 tons of krill each day. That's as heavy as four elephants. Isn't it amazing that such a huge animal eats things that are so small that we can't even see them? Baby whales are called calves, just like baby cows. And also like cows, whale calves drink the milk that their mothers make inside their bodies until they're old enough to start eating krill. That's because all whales, including blue whales, are mammals. Mammals are animals like horses, cows, dogs, and humans, and all mammals feed their newborn babies milk. That's one of the special things that makes makes an animal a mammal. Yeah, they do look more like a fish than like the other mammals. But fish don't feed their babies with milk, which helps us know that whales and fish are different. And there's another important feature that tells us that whales are mammals and definitely not fish. Whales don't have gills to breathe in water like fish do. They have lungs just like us. So even though some whales can hold their breath for over an hour, they have to come up to the surface of the ocean to breathe every now and then. When we breathe, Air goes through our nose or mouth and into our lungs. Whales breathe using their lungs too, but they do it in a very special way. They breathe in and out through a hole on the top of their head called a blowhole. When a whale is ready to take a breath, it comes up to the top of the water 
opens its blowhole, and breathes out. This is called spouting. That air shoots up into the sky, sometimes about 12 meters high. That's about as tall as six grown-ups if they stood on each other's shoulders. Then, the whale breathes fresh air in through its blowhole and goes back underwater. When a whale is underwater, they can pinch their blowhole closed from the inside and seal it shut so no water gets in. But my favorite thing about blue whales are the amazing sounds they make. Blue whales, as well as lots of other whale species, can talk to each other from really far away. Sound travels really well in water, so one whale can hear another whale making noises even if they're thousands of miles apart. Whales make lots of sounds, including squeaks, whistles, and long, low, booming sounds that scientists call songs. Here's what a blue whale's song sounds like. I think whale songs sound beautiful too, Squeaks. Oh yeah, Squeak says he still thinks his imaginary sea monster is pretty cool, but it's even cooler that there are giant blue whales out in the ocean right now, singing to each other, eating microscopic krill, and taking care of their babies. Blue whales are so long. I hope to get to see one someday. Oh, that's a great idea, Squeaks! As soon as we finish our book about giants, we can read one on blue whales. If you like learning about enormous creatures like these, be sure to subscribe to SciShow Kids so you don't miss something big. And we'll see you next time here at the fort.